the word reads, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a powerful passage of scripture. I love this this passage of scripture and uh, you'll see why in a minute, but so much truth in it concerning our Christian journey. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, God. I pray that you would, that you would give us wisdom <clears throat> to hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to us today. God, wisdom to apply it, wisdom to live it out. God, I pray for young and old. I pray, Lord God, that we would, we would take your, your word serious, Lord. God, that we would do as James instructed the church of Jerusalem, to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. God, I pray for your anointing this morning that, that I decrease, that you may increase in this house. Lord, that we uh, not hear my voice, but we hear your voice through me. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, there are indicators all around. <clears throat> you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The title of my thoughts this morning is called Indicators. I need my table. I don't. Um, <clears throat> it's called Indicators. Two weeks ago, we had an experience with the Holy Spirit that is undeniable. I, how many of you were here two weeks ago? I mean, Sunday morning was just, in both services, it was incredible what the Holy Spirit was doing in our lives. A, a call to repentance, a call to, uh, to receive what God has for us. People at the altar asking God to forgive them for their sins. Uh, marriages being restored, broken homes being put back together. And these are the reports that I received from from two weeks ago, relationships being reconciled, and the list goes on and on. You know, people answering the call to serve, people answering the call to ministry. They, these are indicators of the move of God. They're signs. They're, they're symptoms that God is doing something among his people. And I want to continue our journey with the topic of the Holy Spirit today and just and see what the Lord has for us in this department as far as us yielding our lives to the Holy Spirit. So what did we learn two weeks ago? Well, we learned, oh, thank you. You're awesome. Um, we learned two weeks ago that the provision of God comes with the Holy Spirit. If you want God's provision, welcome the Holy Spirit in your life and everything comes with that. Everything. <clears throat> and this week we're going to learn about indicators of a changed life. We're, we're going to talk about how can I tell if I'm changed? How do I know that Jesus really did something in my life? It's a common question that, that people ask when they start following Jesus. How do, how do I know? Well, uh, the Bible is full of indicators. They're tangible evidence that, that a life has been changed, uh, that you've that you've participated in the born-again process of the Holy Spirit. Here, here's how I would illustrate it. It's when a child, you remember being a child and, and telling your mom you don't feel well. Uh, how would she know what's wrong with you? By all the symptoms, right? All the indicators. You're sweating or you have the chills or, you know, your stomach's aching and you've been, uh, you've been complaining about it. She, she, she can tell what's wrong with you, right? It's the same way, like, uh, for most of us that drive with our engine light on, all right? It's like the engine light's been on for two months. You, you just ignore it, but your car's telling you there's something wrong. I know I start, and I know I get you from point A to point B, and I know everything seems okay because the AC's working and, the, and there's nothing wrong with the radio, but your car's telling you, hey, there's something wrong. 
It's an indicator. Here's what indicator means. It's a thing, especially a trend or a fact that indicates the state or level of something. The state or level of something. Here, here's here's an, uh, an example of that is, you know, car ownership. The type of car that you and I drive is an indicator of our influence. Did you know that? The type of house that we live in, the type of clothes that we wear. It's, it's an indicator of our level of wealth. What does that tell you? That tells me that indicators are visible to everybody. Not just you, but they're visible to everybody. And there's indicators all around us. All around us. Most people would rather just turn a blind eye to our indicators. We would rather live in a state of denial. I get it, you know, because if, if we acknowledge the indicators of our life, then we actually have to deal with what they're indicating. We actually have to deal with maybe an issue that it's, it's pointing to or, or maybe a challenge that you've been having. And, and, and to, to live a blind eye towards it, well, that, that's... That's the best way to live because I don't have to deal with it. I, I remember when I, I started to gain weight, Katie and I were newlyweds. And I had, uh, when we were newlyweds, I got married at a young age of 20 years old at, in 1995. And I had a 30-inch waist and I weighed 155 pounds. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? That's crazy. Is that me? That's crazy. I don't even know who that guy is. Like, it's half of my head. It's like, it's, it's nuts. Like, I, I didn't want to dare give you a full body picture because I'm like, no, I can't deal with that. You know? It's, we lived in Dallas, Texas. We were ministering at, at, at Trinity Church. And, you know, and every night, every night after work, we would go out to eat. Every night. That's, that's, you can do that when you don't have kids, right? Because when you don't have kids, you're rich. <laughs> you just are. You know? You, 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 like you're on top of the world. And so we didn't realize it, though. So we didn't know how to take advantage of it other than just eating out. So we would go eat out every night after work. And, and uh, my favorite place to eat was on the border, I, which I don't know why now because I try to go back to on the border. After living in Laredo for 17 years, it's like gross. Sorry, on the border, but it's it's just not good. And um, and so my first year of marriage, I'm just thinking, you know, everyone's telling me, hey, dude, like like slow it down, you're 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 gaining weight. And um, I'm like, nah, <laughs> I'm not gaining weight. And I kept putting it off. And finally, one day, I had a family member just just look me straight in the eye and said, look, dude, you you're getting fat, right? <laughs> What was the indicator? Well, my stomach. <laughs> it's pretty simple. The question is, how could I look myself in the mirror every day and deny it? That's the question. How, how do we look ourselves in the mirror every day and go, mm, nah, you're good. <laughs> right? Because it's always easier to, to ignore the indicators. I mean, I, I love food and I love eating out and I, I love not having a real responsibility of taking care of my body or my health. But the reality is that I did have a responsibility. I had a huge responsibility to take care of my body and take care of my health. I had a huge responsibility. How many of you know that this applies to the spiritual walk as well? This applies to our spiritual journey with God. That we have spiritual indicators that help us measure our spiritual growth or the lack of. Acts 2 gives us our first indicators by showing us lives of, of people. The Bible says 3,000. 3,000 people who, who were saved at the day of Pentecost, their lives radically changed. And how do we know that? How do we know that they, they experienced the born again process in which Jesus talks about in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus? 
Do you, you remember the story in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, the high chief, he comes to Jesus at night because he didn't want to be exposed. And he says, and he's asking him these questions about salvation. And Jesus says, very, very truly, I tell you, Nicodemus, that no one can see the kingdom unless they're born again. And then he continues and he says, no one can even enter the kingdom unless they are born again, born of the Spirit. That's the born again process. That's what it means to be saved. Like people can't even see the kingdom unless they're born again. Let's not talk about getting into it. Can't even see it. And so it might seem a little mysterious to us when we think about the born again process. But if you think about it. You just ponder on it for some time. It's, it's not that mysterious. It, it really isn't. Because to be born again simply means to go from spiritual death to spiritual life. That, that's what it means. When you are born again, you are, you are exiting the old life, le leaving the old spiritual life. Life and you're entering into a new life with Christ. That's what it means to be born again. It's not that mysterious. It's, it's, it's all how it happens might be mysterious. Here's what I want you to know, though. There's, there's no in-between. There, there's no in-between spiritual death and spiritual life. We, we can't live in-between. We are either spiritually deaf or we're spiritually alive. Church, I need you to hear this. I need everyone in this room to hear this, young and old. You're never in between with God. You're either spiritually dead or you're spiritually alive. So what does that mean? It means you're either born again or you're not born again. And, and to, to live in between spiritual death and spiritual life is to ignore the indicators. It's to ignore the signs that the Bible has for us to measure our spiritual growth. Did you know that God measures your spiritual growth? He doesn't just say, oh, say the sinner's prayer and then you can enter the kingdom of heaven. No, not at all. He says, if you're going to be part of me, then you need to crucify the flesh, pick up your cross and follow me. What, what's he saying? He's saying, if you're going to be part of my tribe, if you're going to be part of my kingdom, then you're going to have to follow my rules. I know we don't like to use that word in the Christian faith. Oh, the, the Bible is not about rules. Oh, really? I can find a lot of rules in the Bible that, that if we violate, it immediately puts us into spiritual death. Right? Y'all are quiet. <clears throat> to live in between spiritual death and spiritual life is, to, is a person who doesn't completely trust God the Father. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. If we pay attention to the indicators and not ignore them, we will either be hot or cold. But we'll never be lukewarm. Revelation tells us God rather you hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, he'll spit you out of his mouth. He'd rather you decide I'm either all in or all out. He, he would. You'd rather a person to be honest with themselves to go, God, I want no part of you. I can't serve you. I can't live by your, 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 your laws and, and your governance, and I don't want to do it. Or he wants you to say, God, I'm here for you. Whatever you want, I give you my life. I'm willing to lay it down for you. Wherever you send me is where I'll go. Whatever you want me to do is what I'll do, right? He wants either or. But the Bible says in Revelation, if you're in between, if you can't decide, like you're living in the world and you're living in the church, he, he says, that type of person, I spit out of my mouth. I, I don't want anything to do with them. Here, here's what 1 Peter says. <coughs> Now that you have been purified, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, you have been born again. Do you see that? 
Let me reread that to you. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying what? The truth in which he established so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seeds, seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fall, but the word of the Lord lives forever. He continues in Ephesians. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nature, uh, excuse me, by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Hear this. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. These two passages of scripture, which there are many, speaks of a life that is born again. Speaks of a life that was once in darkness and now is in light. Speaks of a life that lived out the cravings of the flesh. Spiritual death. We lived out the cravings of our flesh. We lived out our, our disobedience and we did whatever we wanted to do. Act any way we wanted to act. And, and all that, Paul says and Peter says, has been put away when you're born again. It's been put away. It's been, it's been done away with. Stay with me because I'm, I'm making a point here. I, I want you to see that, that a person who is, who is spiritually dead has indicators that show that. And a person that is spiritually alive has indicators that show that. So Paul uses words like dead and disobedience, craving of the flesh as indicators of a person who is spiritually dead and he uses words like mercy and love and good works and grace as indicators of a person who is spiritually alive. There's no middle ground here. There's no, there's, there's no in between. You're either alive or you're dead. Jeremiah says it this way in the 17th chapter of Jeremiah. He says, he says curse is the one. Curse is the one who puts his trust in men. He's cursed. He depends on the flesh for strength. He says, because when the heat comes, his leaves will wither up and die. But blessed is the one. He says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whoever finds his confidence in God, because what? He'll be like a tree planted by streams of living water, and his roots will go out. And in the season of heat and drought, he won't fear. He won't worry. In fact, in fact, he will always produce fruit. There's a contrast from a person who is spiritually dead and a person who is spiritually alive. The person who is spiritually dead is always going to trust in his, in his accolades, always going to trust in his academics, always going to trust in his resources and how he survives in this life. But a person who is spiritually alive is going to have confidence in God. And no matter if those things have failed, God will still sustain them. Yeah. Do, do you see the difference?
Which brings us to our chapter, our verse, our, our passage of scripture today. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. It just means that they were in unity. They sold their property and their possessions. They gave to the needy. Everyone met together in the temple courts. They broke bread together. They, they had glad hearts. They were praising God, enjoying the favor of people. And the Lord added to their number daily. You're talking about 3,000 people. 3,000 people had, had given their hearts at the day of Pentecost. And, and here are the indicators of what they did. They devoted themselves to who? The apostles' teaching. It's an indicator. Your, your, your level of thirst for the word of God is an indicator of how your born again experience. Ouch. Ouch. Because some of us probably haven't even cracked the book this week. Some of us haven't, haven't found time to actually be devoted to God in his word. But it's an indicator. It's an indicator of a changed life. Do you remember the day of Pentecost? I shared it two weeks ago. And, and you know, they're all, they all get baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. And, and there are a group of people that are making fun of Peter and the, and, the, and the 120 that are with them. And Peter says, and he stands up and he gives the sermon. He's like, these men are not drunk as you suppose, right? He, he says, and then he goes through, you crucified the living Christ. And, and goes on and on. And finally at the end of the sermon, someone is brave enough to ask, well, what can we do? What should we do? And Peter says, be baptized. And repent of your sin, and you shall be saved. Right after that moment, that experience of being born again, you see these indicators that Luke is writing about. Right after. No one had to teach them. It, it, was, it was innate. It, was, it came from the spirit that was in them. There was a hunger in the hearts of these people to learn more about God. It was, there was this desire in the hearts of these people to be devoted to the apostles' teaching because they knew that the apostles had spent time with Jesus. We need to know as much as you know about this Jesus because I'm, I, I'm thirsty for it. I'm, I'm hungry for it. It's an indicator. It was an indicator that they fellowship with one another. You're talking about... A mass group of people who do not know each other. If you understand, if you understand biblical traditions, the, Pente the Jews came from all over. They came from all over to offer their offering on the day of Pentecost. So these are so many different types of backgrounds, social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, you know, educational backgrounds, all types of people coming together. And 3,000 of them give their heart to Jesus. And there's this indicator of fellowship. They wanted to actually be with each other. It was an indicator. It was an indicator to breaking bread. That not only did they fellowship, but they broke bread. They're two different things. They, they, they sat and ate dinner together. They, they, they learned about each other's life. Because having dinner with someone in biblical days was a very intimate thing. It wasn't just a fast food moment. It wasn't just, hey, let's go down to Logan's and eat together and, and, you know, we're done in 20, 30 minutes. It was a process. And so when you read that they broke bread together, it was an all-day process in which these families had spent time together. It was an indicator that something had changed in their life. It was an indicator that they devoted their life to prayer. Quiet. 
church. These, these are signs for us as individuals to, to measure our life and to measure our spiritual growth and say, okay, do I fellowship with the believers? Oh, no, not really. Do I break bread with them? No, not really. Well, do, do I have a hunger and a desire for God's word? Well, I at least have that, right? But do you really do it? There's a difference from, from actually wanting to do it and actually doing it. Am I devoted to prayer? How's my prayer life? Am I spending time with God the way I should be spending time with God? Am I praying for my, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I praying for the laborers as Jesus in, in, or asked us to pray for? How's my prayer? Because it's an indicator. Listen, if there's not a prayer life activated in your life right now, it's an indicator. And the list goes on. Meeting in the temple courts is an indicator. They like going to church. They like hearing the preaching. They liked whatever church was like back then. It was an indicator for them. Selling possessions in, 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 their, in, their, in their property. where They were generous people. They, they, went from, they went from, hey, this is mine to who's in need because I'm going to sell what I need to sell so that someone else's life can flourish, so someone else's life can be cared for. There was this generosity that became an indicator. All in this one little passage of scripture, there was hospitality. They went to each other's homes. They didn't know these people. They just, they just went to each other's homes and they hung out with each other. It's like me going to your house right now. Are you going to feel comfortable with me in your house? Or am I going to feel comfortable with you in my house just hanging out and we're just going to sit there and stare at each other until we get to know each other. You know, there was this hospitality there. There was this leadership. Someone had to take leadership for these life. Someone had to, had to begin to put in order, how are we going to do this? 3,000 people, what, how do we disciple them? There was discipleship taking place. There was evangelism. You see, the, the Bible, Luke records that God added to their number daily. Well, how did he add to their number? Unless someone went and shared what God was doing among them. There was worship. The Bible says that they gave praise to God. All these indicators immediately after the day of Pentecost. The moment of a born again experience. These indicators. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Luke described the unity of the believers. They had this, the, the, this understanding that, that there was there was to be har harmony among the people of God, not fractions and, 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 and divisions and, and, and slanders. And, you know, they, they understood that. It was just, it was an indicator. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to those in need. Luke was showing the levels of generosity from a heart that is spiritually alive. From a heart that is spiritually alive. I mean, we, we, we wrestle with the tithe, right? I can barely give 10% of $100, right? God, how dare you take $10 from my 100 But the Bible shows in Luke's writing that when they were born again, they were willing to sell their property and their possessions so that people can be ministered to. I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a heavy indicator, but it's there. It's, they continue to meet together in the temple courts. Luke was showing the importance of church community and the gathering for services. I mean, today we, 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 we hear people say all the time, you know what, I don't have to be in church to be part of the church. That doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense in scripture. But that's our heart. That's an indicator. Someone doesn't want to be around the people of God. Doesn't make sense. You've heard me say it before. Like God's not going to make, your, make you your own little paradise in heaven just because you don't want to be around people. He's not going to do it. We're all going to spend eternity together. Look at your neighbor because you're going to spend eternity with them. You're spending life in paradise with your neighbor. question 
for you and me this morning is, what are your indicators saying? I know what their indicators pointed to. I know what Luke was writing about the 3,000 people in his day and what he had experienced and what he was observing from a life that was cut from the message of Peter to a life that decided I'm going to follow Jesus. I know what he records, but what are our indicators? What, are, what is our life saying about us? Because that, that's a big question for us today. Are they pointing to a life that is spiritually alive or are they pointing to a life that is spiritually dead? What are your indicators saying? Are, are, they, are they saying you're, you're in the middle? You're kind of deceiving yourself. You, you kind of live like the world and look like the world, but there's this part of you that wants God in, in your life. What, 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 what are your indicators saying? I pointed out spiritual indicators. Here, here's, here's Paul pointing out indicators that, that point to a spiritually dead life. He says in Galatians, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are, these are signs, these are indicators of a life that is not living towards God. Young people, pay attention up there. I'm talking to you. This is important. Listen, 2 Timothy, this is what Paul says. He says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. This is those people that live in between the spiritual dead and the spiritual living. They have this form of godliness. They look like the church. They act like the church. They speak like the church. But Paul says th that they had to have nothing to do with them. It's crazy. Like we can deceive ourselves to the point where we think we are spiritually healthy. And God has given us indicators everywhere going, look at this. You don't want to read the word. You don't want to spend time in prayer. You, you, don't, you don't want to fellowship with believers. You don't want to go to church. You don't want to worship God. You don't want to evangelize. You, and the list goes on. All from Luke chapter 2, verse 42 to 45. But yet we have all these, these fleshly indicators. Here's what he says in Ephesians 5. He says, for God, follow God's example, therefore as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among them, listen, it says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral or impure or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. It says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not partner with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light. Look, I, I get it. I get it. You love sermons when I'm preaching about how God's blessing is going to come in your life and how God's going to heal you and deliver you and how the enemy has no control in your life. But when I'm talking about you making a decision to be spiritually alive or spiritually dead, we get pretty quiet around here. We get pretty quiet around here because now you actually have to take the, the responsibility for yourself and go, what are my indicators saying? What are my indicators saying? Are, are, am I spiritually alive or am I spiritually dead? Now 
imagine if we lived with awareness of all the indicators of our life? Would we be able to live, listen, you would be able to live a full and complete Christian life. The Bible's very clear about that. That, that you, you would be whole. I, I want you to, to inventory your life in the next few moments. I want you to think about the indicators. What are they pointing to? What, what are they pointing to? Are they pointing to spiritual growth? Or are they pointing to spiritual stagnation? Are they, are they pointing to you becoming more like Christ? Or are they becoming less like Christ? What, what are your indicators pointing to? Here's, here's the thing about the indicators. They're assigned to you. They're assigned to you to measure your life and your spiritual growth. But everybody sees the indicators. Everybody. Like, I can't hide my weight from you. It's there. It's here. It's, it's in front of you. I can't tell you, hey, I'm skinny. I, I have a waist of 30 inches. I can't tell you that because the indicators are in front of you. You're like, whoa, pastor, like, there's this dissonance happening. Like, there, there's... There's something wrong, you know, you have body dysmorphia, like, like there's, you need to understand, you know. But we do it all the time as Christians. We say, I love God. I love God. But you, we, we would never find you at a weekly prayer meeting, ever. But it's one of the indicators that they are born again, that they devoted their lives to prayer. Read through the book of, La uh, book of Acts. You'll find that the Christians were always praying together and fellowshipping. It's one of the indicators. Like you'll say, oh, I'm going to heaven, but yet you don't read your Bible. H how's, that, how's that even possible? I, I don't understand that. It's like I, I want to be your warning sign. I want to be the, the siren going off in your heart today going, wake up, wake up. Listen, the time is short. You cannot deceive yourself anymore and think that you can live in between spiritual life and spiritual death. You're either alive or you're dead. You, you can't be in between. And the only way to tell are your indicators. They're there. We, we say we love Jesus in the church. But yet no one wants to do the ministry of the church. We leave it to other people. Someone else will do it. Ouch. Let's not there get on generosity and money. I, that's not the point of my sermon, but we can go there. It's an indicator. It's an indicator. Like where your heart is, there your treasure will, will also be. Other people can see your indicator. What are they pointing to? Are they pointing to growth? They're pointing to apathy. They're pointing to a passion for Christ. They're pointing for to, to lethargic attitude. Uh, I don't care. What are your indicators pointing to? Because if you choose to ignore them, if you choose to ignore them, we only deceive ourselves. Because God sees them, and everyone else sees them. They're a sign, they're a measurement for your growth. How are you measuring up today? Is your fellowship more with the world or the church? Do you have a devoted prayer life? Are you devoted to, to the church community or are you devoted to secular community they're all indicators I told you it was short and sweet we have, we have, we have to make a decision here if your indicators are, are pointing towards spiritual death today's the day Today's the day. 
to ask God to forgive you? Do you know what your indicators are pointing to? 